shop, we can't lose, you can't win, if you snooze, so do more, and say less, so get up, and let's work, and be the best, yeah, you tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, yeah, the Steve Gunner Podcast, you tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast, get up, it's the Steve Gunner Podcast. Welcome to another episode of the Steve Gunter Podcast, where we discuss the steps, the strategies, and the mindset of real estate investing tailor-made for the pro athlete. I'm your host, Steve Gunter, and it's an honor and privilege to be on with you today. Well, look, folks, today we have a very special guest on with us. Uh, we have on uh, Mr. Sky Michaels, he's an award-winning real estate leader, speaker, and coach, empowering others to unlock their full potential by leading with kindness. He is the founder of a community called the 6 AMers, which is a motivation and accountability group for entrepreneurs and professionals. He is the former head of coaching at Compass, and today, Mr. Sky serves as the founder and CEO for With Heart coaching. Sky Michaels, what an honor it is to have you on today, my friend. Uh, it's a, I, all the honor is mine and I'm beyond thrilled to be on here and talk to you. So, Listen, listen, look, there's so much for us to talk about today. And before we dive in, I would be remiss if I did not mention that uh, here at the Compass community, we are just very grateful for you. I mean, you have done such an outstanding job of uh, helping to develop the careers of agents across this entire country. And my gosh, man, I mean, you, you, you have so much to talk about in that world. I mean, you've built, helped people build a number of businesses, man. What, what, what do you attribute that to? I think it, I attribute it back to the fact that I've always had this servant heart and for a very long time, since very early age on, I knew I wanted to give back. And I originally thought I was going to be a high school history teacher. And I was, uh, before I got into real estate and fell in love with that. So I think the, the thing that excites me is this ability to, to know that the more I become the light, the more I can give of the light. And it's a line I use often because I think sometimes I'm a recovering people pleaser. Uh, <laughs> so, um, when I say I'm a recovering people pleaser, I, I try really hard not to attribute my happiness based on what others do right? People pleasing, you know, so mm -hmm. oh, if you're happy, I'm happy. And uh, it's a skill I've developed over the years. And I call it being the light, not giving the light. So in mm -hmm. other words, the more I try to make sure I'm building myself up and building, working on myself and showing people my vulnerability, showing people where I'm struggling, but then showing them also how I'm overcoming it. The more people actually will learn from that than me just standing on stage telling people what to do, giving them, Hey, do this, do this, do this. People don't learn like that. They actually learn through going, growing through inspiration. So I think I've had this unique ability to, uh, sort of be the light and not give the light. And through being the light, I, I inevitably allow people to discover their own. And, uh, like I said, it's, it's been a, a journey. It still always is a journey mm -hmm. of making sure I'm not being a people pleaser, mm -hmm. you know, I still work at that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it'll always be one of those things. So I'm thrilled and I'm honored to be here and I'm grateful for all the compass people across the country that I consider friends and colleagues and coworkers, even, even though I'm not technically a compass employee anymore, mm -hmm. you know, I still consider it still in my heart always. Well, we miss you. We miss you. And and I'm sure we're going to still see you around, no doubt about it. Um, uh, but, you know, Sky, take me back to Poughkeepsie, New York. Yeah. Uh, you write about how your mother served as yeah. the early model for practicing happiness yep. as opposed to chasing it. Yeah. What does it mean to practice mm -hmm. happiness? So we grew up, uh, my, my mom was a single mom, you know, me and I two. I have an older sister and a younger sister. And we, you know, we grew up poor. Um, and like, like a lot of people out there in the world, you know, you, you have this option every single day to either focus on what you don't have or focus on what you do have. And the story I like to tell about my mom is that I never knew we were poor until the day that we filled out um, forms, like even though we had like reduced lunch and free lunch at times, mm -hmm. and 
I never felt poor. I never really knew we were poor. And then I remember the day that we were filling out the college application and the, the financial aid forms. Mm-hmm. Wrote down how much she made. I'm like, yep. wait. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, I was old enough to have an understanding. I was like, wait, that's what we live on. And it just shocked me, it blew me away. And my mom taught me to, no matter what is going on, no matter what's happening in your life, that there's always this bright, positive side that you can focus on. And trust me, there are struggles, right? There's moments of, of anger and, and hardship and all this. But throughout it all, when we stuck together and we worked together and we loved each other, we were able to find massive levels of happiness that were not dependent upon economics. Mm. And I look back on my childhood and, and it, I think it's a challenge now too, as a parent, I have a 14 or 11 old, right? And it's like, how do we teach the struggles we had as kids, the lessons we learned through struggling mm-hmm. as a child, but I don't want my kids to struggle the way I did. And I don't have the answer to this, by the way, this is like a, mm-hmm. a challenge, yep. right? Like, yep. like how, do we, how do we actually teach these great lessons that we learned? Or, you know, we learn through this struggle, but yet I don't want my kids to struggle mm-hmm, <laughs> to mm-hmm. learn it. I, and it's a, it's an irony when I look back, but, um, you know, my mom to this day is this woman that her, I, I say she exudes love mm-hmm. and everywhere that that woman walks, there's like a trail of love, like coming off of her, whether it's animals or people or the community. And, you know, my house was always that house that all my friends felt was like this safe haven, you know? So my house was always the house that everyone came back to. Uh, Everyone was always hanging out at just because of the fact that my mom created this, this feeling of love uh, Mm -hmm. in that household that permeated not well beyond me, but into my friendships and all my, you know, my teammates when I was playing sports and everything like that. So um, I attribute a lot of who I am today to my mom and most of the lessons I've learned began in those early days, um, you know, with everything that she taught us as kids. When I read that line that, um, that you have to practice happiness, Mm. it it just, there was a light bulb that came on in my head and it was, you know what? It is just like in everything you have to work at it. Is that what, is that where you're going with that sky that you you have to? Yeah. We don't want to work at it though. Okay. This is the this is the key thing, right? Because work denotes like struggle. Mm. What we want to do is we want to play at it, and and think about this, like, and I think the problem is right, like we have these cell phones, and so we go on to Instagram. I bet most people are spending a, an hour on social media a day, if mm. not more. So you're on social media and you're watching images of perfection, and your 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 brain is sort of saying, wait they're happy automatically. Why am I not happy? Mm -hmm. And what people don't understand is that happiness is as that's something you actually create. And once again, you practice that or you play at. And I think a lot of people don't understand that you actually need to understand like these things that, uh, whether it's meditation or working out or reading or playing with your kids or cooking dinner or eating healthy food, you know, it could be, it's a million things that describe what happiness or what can create happiness for people, Mm -hmm. they don't realize that we actually have to practice at it Mm -hmm. or AKA play at it. Right. And I think in some ways, that's why I want to reframe it away from work because we don't want to make it hard. Mm -hmm. We want to make it enjoyable, right? We don't want to grind. We want to, we want to play. We want to be in flow. Like Steve, you were an athlete, you Mm -hmm. were a football player. Mm -hmm. When you were on the field and you were thinking and like working hard, you weren't playing at your max when you were, what position did yeah. you play? Steve? What, yeah. I played DB. DB uh, great. Mm-hmm. Uh, free safety as well. So yep. when you know that flow you're in, you yeah. almost can predict where the quarterback's going to throw the ball. Yep. You almost could predict where the running back is going to break through. Cause you're not even thinking. And I think that developed because in football you practiced playing. So when you actually got on the field, you just were in flow. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really great example that we can come back to with happiness, that what we need to do is we need to practice this in the early mornings or the yeah. evenings or when we when we have some free time. So when you're reading a self-help book or I'm journaling or I'm meditating, what I'm really doing is I'm practicing 
and getting ready to be in flow for the for the day mm. right because then in the day when i have that quote unquote running back or the wide receiver running at me right i'm yeah. just in flow yeah i just go with them i see the ball before it's even thrown and i i'm on, and i'm playing at this level that is almost like above everyone else because of the fact i practiced it and imagine you're a football player you just show up to the field you get on the field you're going to get run over and mm -hmm. i think that's unfortunately a lot of people in life they don't recognize that we do need to practice and play at this so when it comes into this the the everyday life we're in flow and the things that are thrown at us the the deals falling apart our kids getting in trouble at school our car yeah. breaking down our, you name it right yeah all of a sudden that's not even an issue that we're just in flow that's just part of life Right. Sky, how how important is it to get into that flow early in in your day? You wake wow. up, you you you've already mentioned meditation. Yeah. Um, you know, perhaps, you know, some people do it early in the morning. I know I do. But how important is it to get into that flow early in a day, you know, as opposed to waiting until yeah. that moment comes when you feel it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's a you know, you, yeah. yeah. It's too late. So and once again, I, I want to stress this with I think sometimes people feel sometimes people use this line that I'm not a morning person as an excuse. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be a morning person to get into a flow in the morning. Right. And to practice happiness in the morning, because the reality is one minute of meditation is better than zero. Mm -hmm. The reality is uh, one push up is better than no push ups. The reality is one page of reading is better than zero pages of reading. Right. You get the point. Yeah. So there's a world where we overthink what we need to do. We think we need to go work out for an hour at Orange Theory or, you know, kill ourselves in the gym. The reality is your body's meant to move in the morning. You're meant mm -hmm. to get your blood going. Um, meditation. People grossly overthink meditation. How many of us drink a cup of coffee? Pour that cup of coffee, put it down, take a sip, and then you close your eyes for a minute. That's meditation. And I think this thing, we, what we need to do is we need, we need to build structures and once again, practices in the morning that allow us to play during the day in a really high level. So my recommendation to people out there is you want to build a routine that operates in crisis and in non-crisis moments, right? Meaning in crisis, like, oh my God, like I got a lot going on. You still have the ability to flex down. And there's a great book, The Miracle Morning. You know, I don't know if you mm. ever read great. No. Elrod. Mm -hmm. So he talks and it's a short read, quick read. Um, and he talks about how his miracle morning can be done over an hour or over six minutes. Right. He has a routine that he can do in six minutes where he reads for a minute, meditates for a minute, does push ups for a minute, uh, journals for a minute. You get mm. the point. Right. Yep. So in, and I think in many ways, too, that even that's probably too much. Like you could boil it down to just one thing in the morning that you're going to make sure you do every morning and that's going to set you up for the rest of the day. So, you know, I think it's a, it's a really, really critical thing that people recognize the importance of starting your day. And let's be real. I'm holding up my cell phone for <laughs> right now. 99% of the world and ask your, if you're listening right now or you're watching, ask mm -hmm. yourself this question. Do I wake up? grab my cell phone and immediately go into text, email, and or social media, or all three? If the answer is yes, you are immediately plunging yourself into stress, overwhelm, depression, like negativity, first thing in the morning. So I want to challenge people out there, Steve, I don't know if this is mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. I want to give you a challenge for one week. All you need to do is plug your cell phone in across the room. Yep. That's yep. it. Turn if if you use it for the alarm, great. Turn the alarm off. Leave it there. Get get your cup of coffee, your glass of water, and then just literally that's that's if that's all you do, and then go back up and get it. Just give yourself that three five minutes of break mm -hmm. before we dive into. I call it the three headed monster: text, <laughs> email, social media. <laughs> yeah. Well, I tell you one thing, Scott, for some people, you got their anxiety going up, just the idea of sticking that phone across the room. <laughs> but that's good. That is that is incredibly helpful. No, no doubt about it. So 
So you grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York. Yep. And uh, at one point in your life, you were a paper boy. I, <laughs> I think I think you and I have uh, a lot of things in common. Yeah. Hey, Scott, perhaps you were more successful as a paper boy than I was, though. <laughs> I, I, you know, but I'll let you talk about your side first. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I said before, we grew up, we grew up poor. So yeah. at the age of 12, there's nothing you can't work at like uh, a movie theater or McDonald's or anything like that. Cause, you know, I think, I can't remember, I think it was 14, whatever the minimum age, work age was, right? It was not 12. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, being a paper boy was actually a, that was like, you're a 1099, you're a business. Mm -hmm. So the irony, I've been an entrepreneur since the age of 12. So at 12, I actually could be a paper boy. And you know, once again, it wasn't just me, it was my mom and my sister also had a route. So three of us would wake up really early in the morning. Yep. And the tough thing, you know, that if you were a paper boy, mm -hmm. you know, it's, every, it's seven days a week, every rain, day. Sign, you know, if it's snow, whatever it is, you're delivering that paper and you hear it, you know, they drop off the bundle on the yep. Like yep. slam and you're like, okay, here we go. Sky, I got to cut you off right here, yeah. man. I would hear, I would be so <laughs> angry, Sky. I would, <laughs> I would be so angry having to get up and say, oh my goodness, I got to go deliver these papers, go. you know, but that, that, that's what I thought at that age, but, uh, but it was now thinking back, I'm like, man, that was a great job. Great job. Yeah. Yeah. We mm -hmm. got tips. We got, I mean, we, yep. we made good money for a 12 yep. year old. Let's be real. I did That's pretty good money. Yeah. And you know, so I think it's the kind of thing that would, what it did for me though, is it, Hey, it solidified this idea that I could wake up early before yeah. everyone else. Yeah. Um, I fell in love with the mornings a little bit because it was so quiet, right? You're delivering that paper. There's no one awake. You know, and it also gave in me a little bit of a work ethic that I think really helped me throughout high school, college and into my my life in the sense that my friends were all sleeping in their beds and then I'm out in the snow delivering paper. Yeah. And, and this is a good example of my mom. Right. Teaching us that no matter what was going on, you always, you, you know, not not that you always need to be happy. I'm not saying like I was out there in the snow and I was like, yay, yay. But I always made the best of it, right? I always, you know, was like, okay, it's snowing. Here we go. Let's get after it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And mm -hmm. I think that really, really helped me as an, it definitely helped me as an athlete. Um, and it definitely helped me as a student in school. And it definitely helped me now in my, you know, my current life as well. I still think, I'm sure you'd think back to that time frame mm -hmm. too, right? Big time. Yeah. Big so time. Big it was, time. Uh, a great experience. And I actually did it. I think I wanted, I had to check my mom. I think it was about three years I did it. So, oh, that's yeah. a good length of time. Good length of time. Yeah. So, and it was, uh, it was great. You know, like I said, it got, it taught me a lot of lessons and I, I made a lot of money doing it too. Yeah. Yeah. Not too bad. Yeah. So, so now let's, let's transition to your time at Syracuse. Yeah. So now you're, you're in sport, you're on a rowing team. And, and I imagine, I mean, first of all, the, the, <laughs> the physical, <laughs> uh requirements for that particular sport is i i know that is yeah. something but talk a little bit about what you learned about yeah. discipline and commitment yeah. and you know all of those valuable principles that you get from being a part of a team like that yeah um crew first of all you know crew rowing it's it's the ultimate team sport because of the fact like football i played football as well in high school yeah as a team sport but you could also really dominate with one really great player do you know what i mean yep i i, I when i was playing ed, ed adams was our like this, you kick the ball to this kid he's running a touchdown it's back. done you know <laughs> so anyways in college though when i and i rode in high school and then in college crew is the ultimate team sport because you have a 60 foot boat that's about maybe 18 inches wide you have eight six five or i'm i'm six foot so i'm short mm -hmm. right you have six foot to six five six six guys 220 to 250 pounds moving in this boat with 15 foot oars mm -hmm. if you're not in sync with your team yeah you're not going anywhere yeah. like you're, you're not doing anything you know and then you have the cox and the guy in, in the back of the boat that's really guiding you all so one of the key things i learned about discipline is that discipline is easy when you're surrounded by community. 
Mm, that's rich. Discipline is easy when you mm. surround yourself with community. Mm -hmm. Discipline is really hard when you isolate yourself. There's very, you know, yeah. David Goggins, uh, some really extreme people can be very disciplined on their own. But let's be real. We're human beings. We're, yep. we're communal people. And anyone on, that's listening to this, if you need discipline, create a community. Hmm. And that's what really crew taught me. I didn't row because I love being on the water at 5 a.m. in Syracuse, New York in March yep. when it was snowing. Yep. <laughs> I rode because of the fact that Pat Dalton and Jamie Bettini and Joe Bifano and all my guys, Jay Hill, I could, name, I could go down the line and name them all, right? I got up because there was no way in hell I was letting them down. Yep. There's no way that I would, it, to this, I just got chills thinking of the idea of letting mm. my brothers down. Yep. And that's the kind of thing that I think if you're out there and you're trying to create discipline and you're doing it alone, good, you, you know, yeah, it's possible, man, it's hard. Mm -hmm. The other thing I learned about discipline, discipline is fun when you have a community. Right. You, you know, this from yep. you know, being yep. on the football team, how much fun was it to be on a team? Yep. The joking around the, the, you know, the best part was the ride to and from practice. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk about, you know, oh, you, you, if anyone outside of you was listening, you're, they would be like, what are they talking about? Mm -hmm. But internally we were dying laughing to this day. We tell the same jokes yep. that we told to this day. So I think this, this concept of discipline, um, we're taught it's this really, really hard thing. But what we're, it's really hard when you're alone. Mm -hmm. And so for anyone on this call, one of the things that I think I'd recommend for everyone is actually learn how to find a community or create a community. Mm -hmm. And anything you want to accomplish, whether it's losing weight, uh, not drinking, whether it's being a great parent, being um, a uh, meditating, you name it, find a community. Have fun with that community and your discipline is easy. Mm. How important is discipline to success? It, it better, better put, is it even possible to achieve success without discipline? It's possible if you're consistent. And I guess they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess it's so to answer the question, you actually can achieve success without discipline. Discipline, but I'm going to reframe that in the sense that discipline with consistency, mm -hmm. and they're sort of they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Consistency sort of is discipline, right? Mm -hmm. That's the key to success. So you could do real estate's a great example. You could door knock, you could do sphere of influence, you could do internet leads, like anything works as long as you're disciplined, right? Yeah. And and or consistent. Yeah. You know? So yeah. I think there's this world where they go hand in hand. So you can be successful without discipline because it is possible, I think. I think we do see this in real estate, right? Mm -hmm. There are definitely realtors who are, quote unquote, successful uh, without the discipline, but they probably have discipline in, in personal relationships or they, it's hidden deep down. Um, but I do think there's a really, really big world where consistency is the ingredient to success that mm -hmm. people just really, really miss. And I think we overthink what we need to do. Like I said, for most people to get in shape, they don't need to go run a marathon. They need to go walk a mile a day, every day, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> you don't need to, uh, you don't need to go on these extreme diets and fast for three days and just drink <laughs> water. You actually just need to, you know, eliminate processed food from your diet. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. little things that we need to do, but then we got to do it consistently. And that, that's what really creates that success that everyone is craving, you know? Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. You know, when you got into the real estate business, I think it was 2002 when Correct. you got your license. Yep. What was the market like at mm -hmm. that particular point in time? What level of consistency yeah. did you have to display in order to begin to build a career at yeah. that particular point in time? I feel really, really blessed to have gotten in when I did in 2002. Mm -hmm. um, the market at that time was on the beginning of a really, really uh, rapid rise, and meaning in a good way. Like, and when you think of inventory levels today, they were double back then what they were. And mm -hmm. 
the mortgage, I don't know, when did you get in, Steve? I got in in 2011. Great. So you got in after all these really, really 100% mortgages, yep. and, right? Subprime and everything like that. So basically, if you had a pulse, you got a mortgage. Mm -hmm. So 2002 to 2006, six seven, pretty much everyone was buying a house. Everyone, right? And so I was very really lucky because I did, I was a teacher. I graduated from Syracuse. I became a high school history teacher. I only started doing real estate for a side gig. I, you know, I wanted a little extra money. Yep. Yeah, I graduated from college and I was still poor. Yep. <laughs> as a teacher, yep. <laughs> right? so I still need a little extra money. And I fell into it and I was like, I fell in love with it. And it was really successful, but I wasn't convinced it was real. Do you know what I mean? Yep. And so I had to almost convince myself like, wait, I just, I went to five years of a college. I have a master's degree and I'm going to actually leave that to go sell houses at hundred percent commission. Yeah. <laughs> and I, you know, grown up poor, all I craved yeah. grown up was stability and I created it, right? I had the job, I had the health insurance, I had the benefits, I had the retirement and I'm going to leave that for a hundred percent commission selling houses. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I really needed a lot of time to convince myself that it was real before I left. So I feel really lucky to have gotten in in 2002 because if I, it, it's way more challenging now because of where, A, the inventory levels are just really, really low, historically low right now. So the number of transactions are lower. And then B, you know, it's much harder for buyers to get a mortgage and therefore, you know, it, it's the way it should be, by mm -hmm. the way, the way it should be, you know, it shouldn't be easy to get a hundred percent mortgage of four hundred thousand like dollars yeah that, you know sure uh thank god we corrected that but at the end of the day it does make it a little more challenging today getting in as opposed to 2002. So. sky you said something though that just caught my attention so you were a history teacher and you were doing real estate part-time you know just to supplement your income make right. a little bit more money um obviously growing up uh the way that you did I would imagine that stability was really important to you at that particular time. But then at some particular point, you made a mental shift and embraced risk fully. Yeah. You know, and and opted out of stability yeah. for risk. Yeah. What was going on in your mind, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, it, you know, you go back into this world where when when you learn that happiness is not money, Right. Mm -hmm. It allows you to almost like remove that stability because there are lots of periods of my life where I've actually done the same thing. Mm. Right. So and I'll, I can detail them, but I think many people are afraid of losing stability. So therefore they're stuck. Yeah. And when you develop the ability to not be afraid of the future, Right. And when you develop an ability to say, you know what, I'm always going to bet on me. It, it allows you to take risks that other people won't. And another, a good example of that for me was back when I was at Keller Williams and I was a, one of the original owners of uh, a really successful KW uh, office. And we had built it up and we were launching title companies and mortgage companies like yeah. we were doing the thing. In 2018, Compass came to town and you know, they wanted me to be the managing director for Philadelphia. And in other words, like help launch it. And I basically made a really risky decision in 2018. Compass, remember, was only five years old. Mm -hmm. um, I was at a, an office and a company, KW, was very established, very successful. Yep. I was on the pathway, right? And I was, I was getting a divorce. There were other factors involved in the decision. But at the end of the day, I made a decision that I was going to go with this brand new company called Compass that everyone around me said, you're crazy to do this. This is, you know, you're committing career suicide. Like they're going to be bankrupt in a year. Mm -hmm. They're burning cash. You, you, you've heard it, Steve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I left basically everything I built to go build this next company, you know, and it, I will forever be grateful for to Robert and the leadership team, Rob Lehman, who's doing another venture now and all these great, great people, Rory Galad, right? All these amazing people that took the risk to form Compass and then to this day are, are continuing to forge it forward. Yeah. And then two months ago, I took another risk, you know, I was in a great job and 
I took a risk that I was going to create a coaching company. Mm -hmm. you know, I was going to leave stability and once again, go create a coaching company. Uh, so uh, the good news and bad news is that I'm very comfortable taking risk and betting on myself. And at the end of the day, I have all the ability there. Don't get me wrong. There's a mm -hmm. lot of fear. There's a lot of anxiety when mm -hmm. you do this. Um, you don't do this without that fear and stress and anxiety. And I'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning at night and be like, oh my God, I got to pay my bills. <laughs> you know? That's right. And, and imposter syndrome, right? Yep. Like, you know, it's really hard. And when I, when I went to Compass, it was very difficult to see, you know, KW posting stuff on social media. and like, yeah. man, we didn't have an office. We were in a WeWork. You know, so you really need to battle imposter syndrome when you take risks. Mm. So anyone on this that's listening to this, if you're debating a big decision or you're taking a risk or you took a risk, you need to almost like have a piece of paper at right there that when you feel imposter syndrome, you just write it down and you ignore it or you burn it or you throw it out in the trash. Mm -hmm. Because you, you know, I, I'm going through this a little now, right? I launched a coaching company. And then I'm looking at other coaches and their websites mm -hmm. or their programs or their, right, what yep. they're offering. And I'm, I'm like, oh, my God, my website is nowhere near <laughs> what theirs is. Or, yep. But I always got to then bring myself back to earth and say, I'm going to be where my feet are. A coach that has been doing it for 20 years, you know, I can't, I'm not there. I'm not going to compare myself to that. What I'm going to compare myself is to a coach who's doing it for two months. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, where I'm at in two months, I'm thrilled with it. So, let's, let's talk about fear, though. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a great topic. In fact, um, how do you relate to fear, Sky? Mm -hmm. um, do you, do you find yourself resisting it at times? Do you always recognize it and embrace it? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Great, about, great yeah. question. Um, you know, you know, the reason you need to practice around happiness is because you're going to feel fear, imposter syndrome, negativity, all these things. Mm -hmm. And what you want is you want the ability to have a practice to fall back on. So when I feel fear, the first thing I do, Steve, is I give myself grace to feel it. Mm. I think what a lot of people do when they feel fear is they almost say, I shouldn't feel this. This is... Why am I going to, I'm going to grind through this. I'm going to just, no, throw all that out and say, give yourself grace. Mm -hmm. Hey, you know what? You took a big risk or you, you know, you're doing something that's big or I, you, you're fearful of whatever it is you're fearful of. The first step, give yourself grace and accept that feeling and be in it. And that's okay to give yourself the time to feel it and be in it. What's not okay is to stay there. Mm-hmm. Right. But it's almost like you're going to jump up onto a block. If you just if you're standing and you try to jump, you're not going to get there. What you need to do is you need to gather yourself. Mm -hmm. So when you feel fear, give yourself grace, feel it and gather yourself. Right. Almost like go backwards a little bit or get into that. You know, the ready, you know, crouching down or ready to explode. Yeah. And then you go to your practice, you know, I go to my workout or meditation. For me, I always go back into like working out. If I'm good physically, I'm really, really well armored against the emotional things that are going to come my way. And then I'm like powerful. So yeah. your bounce back from fear can either be really weak or really powerful. And I've gone through this over the last two months, right? Like I've, you know, I, I shot out of the gate and I was all excited. I didn't give myself time to really grieve or mourn yeah. or feel that fear. And then about a week after I, I left Compass and I was building everything, I was, I was hit with this like crazy sadness over like the ending of a chapter and, yeah. and fear. Like, oh my God, like I got to pay my bills. Yeah. Right. And it's like, okay, I got some money in savings, but you know, I can, that <laughs> you're putting money out for websites and programs and support and, That's right. and money was like, fine. That's right. And I was like, oh my God. So I gave myself a couple of weeks to feel it. Right. And to be in that emotion and then really go back into like my practice. So for me, it's always, always goes back to working out or being physically fit, eating well journaling and meditating mm -hmm. and i do those things 
then all of a sudden I, I slowly felt myself really coming out of it. And now I'm in that like explosion mode yep. where things are just starting to happen. And I think that's the biggest thing about fear is that we can't, if we can't ignore it, because I call this putting a, a happy face sticker on, on a piece of shit. Mm -hmm, <laughs> right? mm -hmm, like yeah. it's there. Like yep. don't it's put right a happy there. Face sticker on it. Don't yep. put the happy face sticker yep. on it. It's still going to smell like shit. Yep. Right? Like look at it and be like, all right, it's there. Let me get rid of it and then move forward. I think Jim Collins refers to that as the confronting the brutal facts. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. And for me too, like this has been really great because like one of the brutal facts I had to confront, you know, is the fact that I spent money like really poor. I didn't, I didn't have a budget. Yeah. I didn't, you know, I was like, I went back and now my sister's helping me with like financial management yep. and wellness and everything like that. Yep. So the nice thing about those moments you feel fear is you always actually experience massive growth on the other side of it. So like now I'm, I'm like finally keeping a budget. I'm like cutting, I'm canceling, you know, subscriptions I've been paying for, for years. Sure. I just didn't know because I didn't even look, yep. you know what I mean? Yep. So it's one of those things that I feel this like massive growth that's happening within me. And I think that's the thing to remind yourself when you feel fear, give yourself grace, gather yourself, get into a position of strength, and then know that the other side of it is going to be really, really explosive and filled with growth. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to be the thing that sort of, you always want to keep that. That's the vision. That's the direction. That's mm -hmm. what we're going towards. All right. Be in the moment, be where my feet are, but no, I'm getting ready to explode. I'm coming at it. Do you know what I mean? I so. do. I do. You talk about this very interesting concept uh, that is widely known, especially in our social media age of hustle culture, uh, hustle culture, excuse me, uh, in that version of success. Um, but but you stress more so the idea of community building as opposed to uh, embracing hustle culture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So hustle culture is this, this is this mindset that if you're not grinding and working 12, 15 hours, if you're not doing these things that no one else is doing on like all this stuff, that's like really hard and frankly, really isolating and frankly, yeah. not very healthy Yeah. at the end of the day, that that's success, right? And we need to battle this mindset and I'll take, I'll take awards in real estate. Right. Like, mm -hmm. you know, some areas like there's these awards for doing sales and all this stuff. But what we don't realize is like that that reward is meaningless. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. like who cares about some trophy? Yeah. The real goal in life is to actually feel happiness and be healthy. Yeah. Right. And, and once again, create community. That's that's what we were born to do. We were born to be happy and healthy. Mm -hmm. And the hustle culture, unfortunately, creates this mindset that if I'm not like working myself to the bone, like I'm not successful. Yep. And I think we really need to redefine that in our, in American culture and our, and especially in the real estate culture as well. And I think we need to redefine what it means to be successful. And I wish we could give awards a to the happiest person and B to the person who has the best tax return. <laughs> right right that should be the real estate award ceremony is it yeah. hey okay steve here you're the happiest person in real estate right? yeah. you know hey uh, steve you got the best tax return yeah with the most residual income from investment property sure. or not right you oh you paid your quarterlies great here's yep. your <laughs> let's give an award for every agent that pays their quarterly tax <laughs> right <laughs> yes that's like a good example and instead i think we're rewarding this this hustle culture where oh go out and buy that really fancy car because it's going to look really good on social media yeah but don't pay your quarterly tax returns yeah. and by the way i'm speaking from experience sure this is um i don't want to be up here saying like oh this is me i'm great Right. Like I've, I've in my career filed my taxes on time. I haven't, mm -hmm. I've owed back taxes. Mm -hmm. I've had, you know, liens filed on me in the past, mm -hmm. like because I didn't pay taxes. Right. Mm -hmm. Stupidity. And I was in that hustle culture. I yeah. was in this culture where I was like, I want to be number one. Yeah. And I look back on it and I was like, so stupid to pursue this trophy yep. to be number one. And I got it by the way, you know where it is? Sure. It's in my basement collecting dust. 
Sky, you 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 touched on a subject there that uh, is is very um, uh, that I can resonate with very closely. I can remember too when I was I, I was doing that, man. I remember earlier in my career I was doing that. I'm I'm chasing this lead. I'm chasing this customer. I'm trying to get this going. I'm trying to do this. Always trying, 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 yeah. Yeah. and 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 I would I would wake up super early. You know, don't get much rest, go to bed super late, not eating well, not working out. You know, my relationship with my wife was not good at the time. It yeah. was just not a good time. And and it wasn't until I went to the doctor, in fact, and the doctor said, Steve, you have got to change some things. Yeah. Um, you know, you got you got high blood pressure and you're, you're, you're a young guy. Well, I, yeah. I wasn't, it wasn't full high blood pressure, but I was there. I was yeah. basically there. And it was, I was running myself in the ground, trying to, you know, do what I thought was what you're supposed to do in right. building a business. Long story short today, I don't do that. And, and, you know, who would have known? Who would have thought that the business is is far better than what it was when I was doing that? And so, I mean, you hit on a very valid point. So that's it. And and I think what you highlighted is that we actually attract more when we're balanced and calm mm. and, and right. And I think, yeah. we, like Steve, you illustrated this point where you were chasing, yeah, and trying, and that's like this form of what I call like resistance, right? This is like energy work when you're resisting. Mm. you it's so much harder to get to where you want to go whereas yeah. when you allow yourself to just free fall and go yeah. and like i said it, so it's not to say that they're that you're not going to work right it's not sure to say that sure let's wake up and just go you know not you know do yoga and never call a client back or anything like that but what it's to say is it, i've used this term in the six hammers we call it being healthy selfish you got to prioritize your health and that when i say health i'm not talking about just working out or like financial health and your family health and your relationship health, that has to be your number one priority and then work. Mm -hmm. Right. And how can we fit work into our health versus our health into work? Right. And that's like this thing that I think we got to change the narrative. And my hope is that people like me and you can, you know, stand in front of people and say, listen, if you're grinding and you're hustling and you're number one and you're, you know, getting your kids hate you and your, your wife leaves you and you're mm -hmm. doing all this stuff. Like you got to look yourself in the mirror and ask yourself why, when you're on your deathbed, yeah. none of this is going to matter, right? Your yeah. community is going to matter. Your impact is going to matter. You know, what you did for your children is going to matter. You know, I love and that. That's it. man. and it's, it's a shame. It's, I think we got a chance, you know, my hope is we got a chance to really impact the younger generations because my fear is they're seeing this on Instagram and TikTok and all this, and they're really being fed these messages. We got to build some strong role models right now, mm -hmm. to really combat some of the messages our, our children and the, the younger generations are being taught. You know, um, you started 6 a.m.ers and you, you talked uh, very briefly about it. I, I would love for you to kind of go into a little bit more detail about it, but uh, I've spoken to so many agents um, within Compass who have just, uh, they have talked about how much that has helped them in their entire career. And before they came to Compass, they didn't have anything like that. Yeah. And then diving into that program and the, uh, the insights they were able to glean, the relationships that they were able to develop, you know, what made you start something like that? And did you... Did you already have the vision of what the six AMers would be, or did it evolve yeah. into that? Yeah. So I'll start with the, the last piece. So in 2017, I was getting divorced, and it was it's it was an amicable divorce, and I'm, I have an amazing uh, co-parenting relationship with my ex-wife. Mm -hmm. um, we we co-parent probably better than anyone I know. Uh, in a lot of ways, we still have our, our times, right? Sure, like, sure. She still get mad at me. I'll still get annoyed with her, stuff like that, right? Like any yeah. relationship. But overall, our kids know that they're our number one and we do holidays. Anyways, 2017, though, I was in the process and I was in a bad space. I was eating and drinking and just not, mm -hmm. you know, taking care of myself and just stressed and like worried and fearful. You know, I mean, it was 
everything. And so one of my best friends at the time, he was a, one of my business partners, Jake Dreyfus. He, you know, I was talking to him and just complaining and telling him everything. He's like, listen, and we followed a guy named Jocko Wilnick. Yeah. Uh, me to Jocko. Mm -hmm. And so Jocko would post a picture. He used to post a picture of his watch every single morning, right? At 434, you know, he'd get up, just post a picture. Yeah. So Jake was like, hey, I'm going to start waking up at 5 a.m. And I'm going to wake you up and I want you to go work out or, you know, just take care of yourself. So we did this for about a month and it was like life changing. Once again. I had my community, even though it was the only community of two. So at the end of that month, and this is going back to like 2017 or so, he's like, what if we did this? Like, let's, let's see if anyone else wants to join us. So we kick an email out to our office and, you know, we had 10 people join us for, for two months and we would do a zoom call like twice a week. So basically we, we uh, set a goal, we read a book. And we would do two Zoom calls at 5 a.m. Mm -hmm. And if that back then, the Zoom calls, we would just hop on and talk a little bit and then get off and go about our day. But it was 5 a.m. Yeah. That was early. Yep. Um, anyways, more and more people started finding out about it. And we just started spreading it a little bit. So when I actually, when I went to Compass, we actually still had the group going. Uh, but then Jake moved to Colorado. I was at Compass. And, you know, it sort of just lost its steam and it, you know, still the Facebook still exists. The group still exists on Facebook today. Mm -hmm. And I still know dear friends uh, from it as well. So I go to Compass, start building, you know, Compass in Philadelphia. And then if you remember March of 2020, there's a little thing called COVID. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and so we go home. I don't, is what, in middle of the month in March. And, oh, two weeks, we'll be home. So we were Think about back then, like the happy hours and the Netflix yep. shows and gyms were closed. I'm like, why work out? Right. Yep. I remember at towards the end of March, just being so incredibly frustrated and just a hey, frustrated myself. Like, you know, why don't, why can't I stop drinking or <laughs> why can't I go to bed earlier, get up earlier? Like, you know, I just didn't know, really know what to do. And it was really scary at that time, especially in, Pennsylvania, or, you know, I don't know. Every state was a little different in it, yep. but we were, we were in the thick of it and we couldn't leave our house basically, you know, like you barely could leave your house. So how were we going to make a living? Like what was going to happen? To you know, it was mm -hmm. all this fear. So at the end of March of 2020, I made the decision. I was like, you know what? I'm going to redo five amers. I'm going to, I'm going to call it six amers, mm -hmm. you know, because of the fact that it's COVID. So, uh, you know, let's pick <laughs> up at six. You know, we don't have to get up really. Right. But, okay, so six is early enough. And in hindsight, I actually love that because 6 a.m. is that early time. Yep. And it's in reach for most people. Right. 5 a.m. is yep. got to be a morning person. Oh, yeah. Yes, you, you know. Like, <laughs> um, anyway, so I started it, sent an email out to my roster in, in Philadelphia, and we had about 50-ish people join up. And I, did, I just basically replicated the model, right? Mm -hmm. We read a book. We did two Zoom calls. The one tweak I made was I started interviewing people on the Zoom calls. Mm. Um, and so we set a one word intention. And so it started up in April 2020 in Philly. And the next month, a, sal a, you know, a sales manager in Boston, Chris Thoman, was like, hey, I, I want to do it. So I was like, cool. He emailed his people. So the Boston got in, and then New York got in. So every month it just started to grow and grow. Yeah. And Oh, I did it for four years, four years. It grew out into the West coast. We launched yep. the West coast one. So, and you, we started this interview talking about discipline and consistency. The reason this group was successful was because of the fact that I showed up consistently yeah. and I was disciplined enough to maintain what it took to, to main, you know, to build this community of people. And the, it's a great example of being the light and not giving the light. And mm -hmm. all I did was show up and be a, as powerful and vulnerable as a presence as I could. From there, other people got inspired and started creating connections within the group and meeting people. And the friendships that have been created within the six hammers are some of the most powerful friendships and connections I've ever seen in real estate or in life. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. These are brothers and sisters and would, would do anything for each other. 
Oh, the thousand percent. The connections are real. And I mean, you can go to a sales meeting or an event and and someone will shout out, hey, where are my 6 a.m.ers at? And everybody, whoa, you know, I mean, it's like a party and it's pretty cool to see. It really is. I mean, deep connections and there's a culture even within that group across the country. It is. And yeah. It's, it's something I'm really proud of and I'll, I'll always carry that that pride with me, you know, for the rest of, uh, you know, probably the rest of my life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, with this coaching company, um, I actually have learned a lot of lessons from running the six hammers that I'm now applying. So the first program I'm launching is a program called the happier human. Mm -hmm. And so the happier human is going to, there's some, some similar elements, but a lot of wrinkles that are different. But one of the things that I, I, I loved was when the whole country came together. So I sort of had an East Coast and a West Coast group. So now you can join. There's going to be two calls on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. East Coast, 2 p.m. East Coast. Mm -hmm. And this way you can choose to join either one. And it's going to allow people from all across the country to meet each other. So the community is going to be really tight and really strong. The other thing with Six Amherst, I never really had the time to create interactions. So everything I do is going to be built on creating this community. Mm -hmm. And I, have, I actually have a post, I'm reading it right now, but commitment, community, accountability, mm -hmm. you know, so we're going to basically create a big community. We're going to make a commitment and the community is going to help us keep our commitments and be accountable. And it's called the happier human. And it's all designed to teach people how to be happy in their personal life and their business life. Yep. And uh, three core values of the with heart coaching company are happiness, healthiness, humanness, mm -hmm. right? So three core values to everything we do. I love that. With heart coaching, is that is that for the entrepreneur, any entrepreneur, any right. business professional, or is it, you yeah. know, who who who's who right. who are you speaking to? Yeah. So um so I I called my former real estate team was called Real Estate with Heart. This mm -hmm. is way back in you know 2013 I formed it. And it was an amazing team. And I, you know, I formed it back then because it stood for the value of caring about people. Yeah. So now when I was building this company and trying to get ready to go out and, you know, trying to figure out a name, I, you know, I knew a lot about the coaching industry. Yeah. Right. And if you think Steve, Steve, na name some coaching companies that are out there. Would name you offhand, name some of them. Uh, uh, Tom Ferris. Great. Uh, Tom Ferry. Tom Ferry. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, Brian, I forget the last Buffini, name. Right? Yes. So you can yes. go down the line. Sure. What do they all have in common? They're a man's name. Yeah. This industry, let's be real. It's not really made up of men. It's there's most, the majority of realtors are women. Number one, the other thing in this coaching industry, it is highly unrepresented with diversity, mm -hmm. you know, black, mm -hmm. Asian, mm -hmm. you name it, Hispanic. How many people are out there of color that are coaching? We need to yeah. change this. Yeah. So if I called it Sky Michaels Coaching Company or mm, Coaching, I see. Yeah. I need to be in front of the room at all times. Yep. So I called it With Heart Coaching because of the fact that I want to be able to create a company that A, can help many industries, not just real estate. And I want to be able to lead from the back of the room. Mm -hmm. And eventually, it's almost like having a, a compass, right? Compass is a brand, but you can you can build your brand above Compass. Sure. So in other words, if someone could coach, keep their name, their brand, while having with heart help them with all the back end and everything else. So there's a world where eventually I would love it if I wasn't even I didn't no one even knew who I was. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. of the fact that we have hundreds of coaches out there who are representing themselves and their communities. And what they do, and all I'm doing is actually propelling them forward. Mm -hmm. So obviously, launching this, I, I'm going to be in the front of the room right now. But I'm working very, very hard to make sure everything that we do revolves around caring about people, and revolves around making sure that we create representation in this coaching community that is is real representation, not just lip service. If that yeah, makes yeah. Right. Do you do you foresee? Um... Uh, with hard coaching, also holding at some point conferences, get togethers, events, yep. things of that Absolutely. sort. Yeah. Yeah. What, so tomorrow actually, so on May 8th, it will be our first happier human call. And 
by the way, people can join any month and it's open to anyone. So the Happier Human is a program that's open to all people, mm -hmm. right? That community is humanity. On top, uh, underneath that, I'm building out two real estate programs mm -hmm. as well. But then the hope is as we move forward here, I'm going to be building out a, a program that hope someone else from the mortgage industry will run for mortgage people. But we're always going to have these, these ideals of running a relationship-based business, mm. right? Um, and then obviously the, the goal will be to create a, you know, in-person events. Um, one of the things we're going to do with Happier Human is on the third Thursday of every month, I'm going to challenge every member of the happier human community to do something in person with other people. doesn't mean you need to do it with people of happier human, but like yeah. if you're a real estate professional, go for a hike and invite your past clients mm -hmm. or go play golf and invite some people, you know, or go right. Do stuff that connects us as human beings. Yeah. Um, maybe eventually I have a dream of that third Thursday. Maybe is all about volunteering or maybe every, you're right. The cool thing is I get to, create from scratch here. Yeah. So it's uh, it's going to be a really, really fun opportunity. The other thing about the happier human is that I try when I was creating it, I wanted to create something that made you had a little bit of skin in the game that you you were, you know, committed to it. Right. Um, so I didn't want it to be free, but I also mm -hmm. didn't want it to be a high ticket price where coaching became available for everyone. Right. And I thought about it like, all right, the price, a cup of coffee costs three dollars, let's say. So I was like, all right, if this program is $100, it's basically you get business and life coaching and a community for the price of a cup of coffee a day. Yeah. So if anyone out there buys That's a cup good. of coffee every single day, you know, you should really make sure you're investing in yourself, your happiness, your health, and creating and being part of a community. Because that's when you're part of a community, discipline, we talked about it, it's easy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's good. When you have a tough time, you got people to lean on. When you want to be motivated, you reach out. We need to learn something, you ask. So community is everything, in my opinion. So I love yeah. that. Where 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 would someone find you at, Scott? Great. Um, so first off, the website is withheartcoaching.com. So nice and easy. Uh, you can find me on Instagram, which is at S-K-Y-E-M-I-C-H-I-E. LS. So it's spelled a little differently on Instagram, mm -hmm. or you could email me at sky at with heart coaching.com. Excellent. Excellent. Man, I tell you the wealth of the nuggets that you <laughs> dropped today. I mean, very valuable. I mean, thank, thank you, you so much, Sky. Really appreciate your time today, sir. Any uh, last bit of words you would like to leave the audience with? Yeah. Um, I want to challenge every person listening to this to recognize that you were born to be happy, to be healthy, and to be more connected as a human being to yourself and other people in your community. Mm -hmm. And every day I want you to wake up and I want you to practice being happy for those moments where maybe it's not so natural. So, Love it. Love it. Mr. Sky Michaels. Thank you so much for your time, Thank sir. Thank you, my friend. It's an honor. Absolute Absolutely. Honor. Thank you for your leadership. <laughs> Thank you. We can't stop. We can't lose. You can't win if you snooze. So do more and say less. So get up and let's work and be the best. Yeah. You're tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast. Yeah. The Steve Gunner Podcast. You're tuned in to the Steve Gunner Podcast. Get up. It's the Steve Gunner Podcast.